To this point, the only type of memory circuit we've covered so far are flip-flops. Well, t technically latches and flip-flops, but we discouraged you from using latches in your designs. Recall that a multi-bit flip-flop is called a register and can be implemented with essentially one line of system Verilog code, not including the signal declarations needed for it. Uh, and I've got it shown here as two lines for readability purposes. This example is a 4-bit register. A RAM is also a memory circuit, but it allows for the storage of an array of values that are accessed using an address input, which where every unique address activates a specific entry in the array. So you could think of a RAM as, as, as essentially like a two-dimensional flip-flop where it has a depth, has rows that are, that are addressed by an index or an address, and the columns are the width of the RAM. The RAMs, though, unlike a flip-flop, they cannot be reset. So you won't see a reset input on a RAM. You declare the memory array like we previously did when storing test vectors for a test bench by specifying the width range before the name of the object and the depth range after the name of the object. Remember that this is the opposite order as compared to the way Java, C++, MATLAB, and even mathematics in linear algebra uh, performs this 2D addressing. The address should be declared as having log base 2 of the depth. So for a depth of 8192, this is this would be 2 to the 13th power and so this gives us a 13 bit address read data and write data which are the data out and data in for the ram should be sized to match the width of the ram which in this case is 32 bits this way we're building a 8192 by 32 RAM. 8192 is the depth. You could think of that as the number of rows, the number of entries, the height. And 32 is the width, the number of bits per row, per address. So 8192 by 32. So this follows the depth and then the width, which is the convention used by now, most programming languages I've used, so C, C++, and Java, as well as linear algebra. Notice, though, again, when we declared the array, in this case we, it was called mem, we gave it the width first, 31 down to 0, followed by the depth second, 81, 91 to 0. But this would be referred to as an 8192 by 32 RAM. FPGAs allow you to initialize a RAM using an initial uh, read mem block, just as we did for our test benches and our test vectors. Uh, but this only works on FPGAs because FPGAs have the ability to initialize their internal RAMs during the configuration of the FPGA because the RAMs are hooked up to the, the big shift register, the boundary scan register that snakes its way through the FPGA. But this initialization is not an option if you're designing for targeting a custom chip, an ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit. There are several options you have when designing the behavior of the RAM, when you're coding up the RAM. The first is the number of ports, which defines the number of reads and or writes that the RAM can perform at, at any given time. This is defined by how many separate statements in the code accesses the RAM. This RAM has one port that can read and also can write, uh, but only to the same address. The, so you have a continuous assignment statement above the always block there that performs reading of address ADDR 
while the always statement allows for writing on address ADDR. And both, both the read and the write can be performed at the same time, but in this case, it can only be performed on the same address. Now you can add additional statements that use different addresses. In fact, you could have, for example, five different addresses, address one through five, and each one of them allow you to read and or write to that address. It just depends on how many statements you have in the code to perform that. And that is referred to the number of ports. The second option you have when designing a RAM is the read behavior. RAMs always write on one of the clock edges, the rising or falling clock edge, when the write enable is high. So if the write enable is high, isn't high, you, you don't write. And if it is high, you write, but only on the clock edge. So in this sense, it works exactly like a register uh, with the added detail that the write is being performed to a given entry inside the RAM that's given by the address. So in other words, writes are always synchronous. They're synchronized to the clock. When writing, a RAM writes the value given on its data input, which in this case is named write data, to the address that's given by the address input on the write port, which in this case is ADDR. In this way, as I mentioned, uh, all RAMs have synchronous writes. Uh, and in this case, we're synchronizing on the rising edge of the clock as indicated by the pause edge clock right there in the, in the always statement that controls the write. However, uh, the designer of the RAM has the option of using a asynchronous or a synchronous read. Some RAMs, such as the register file that we will use when building our CPU, will output the value stored in the array at the address given in the address input without waiting for the clock, without waiting for a rising or falling edge of the clock. This happens because the read behavior is implemented as combinational, uh, or in this case, a combinational continuous assignment statement, although you could also use a always underscore com as well. But either way, you're doing the read without waiting for the clock. Now, in this, in this example, which is slightly different, we've moved the read logic inside the always block specifically the read data less than equal mem at ADDR. This causes the RAM to perform the read in the next cycle after the address changes, basically freezing the read data output until the clock edge. And, and so when the clock edge happens, whatever is on the ADDR input will then be read from the RAM and put out on the read data output and then kept there for the next entire cycle. So these waveforms uh, in, show this behavior. So the top waveform shows the behavior of the RAM with the asynchronous read, which was the first example I showed you. And the bottom waveform shows the example of the RAM with a synchronous read, which is the second example I showed you. Now, now in order to, to, to make this easy to understand, I initialized the RAM such that its contents equal the, ad the corresponding address. So address six has the value six, the address seven has the value seven. So that way we, we, we understand uh, which read is being performed. And so in the top waveform, the data output always matches the address. So when the address is four, the read data is four, when the address is five, the read data is five, when the address is six, the read data is six. So whenever the address changes, the read data is updated immediately, combinationally. Now, if you look at the bottom waveform, there's this delay. So when the address is four, the data becomes four, but not until the next cycle, not until the next rising edge. Likewise, when the address is five, the data becomes five in the next cycle. When the address is six, the data becomes six in the next cycle. So this is a synchronous read behavior, meaning that the read is essentially assuming that everything in your circuit is happening on the same edge of the clock, you'll see a one cycle delay in order to perform a read on the RAM. I also should point out here too that the read data is actually undefined 
at the beginning uh, in the bottom waveform because uh, th th there, there, uh, there was no, essentially no address existed before the waveform began, so there was nothing for the RAN to put out in the first cycle. Now, th this might seem a bit confusing because the address is changing on the rising edge of the clock, and that's also the same rising at the same edge of the clock where the RAM actually is doing its read and, and its write. Uh, now, this makes sense because keep in mind that the inputs of the RAM are usually coming from another logic element that has a delay to it. So in other words, when you look at the input to the, to the address on a RAM, if, you know, it appears that that address is changing exactly on the clock edge, but in reality it's going to be changing a little bit past the clock edge to account for the delay of the circuit that's driving that address input. But that delay is not shown in a purely behavioral simulation because we're not giving the simulator any information about the underlying technology and, and what the delays are. So keep in mind that the input is, is in practice would be delayed. So whenever you have a rising edge of the clock, a circuit will see the value that was on the input before the rising edge of the clock. That's the general rule of thumb that, that, you, should, that you should remember. I, I found a little bit of a hiccup though. Um, this is something I forgot about. If you simulate a RAM with a test bench, which is what I did here. I wrote a test bench around the code that I showed in, in, the, in the examples and I ran it. You have to be sure, in order to get this simulation, you have to drive the clock with a blocking assignment and the other inputs with a non-blocking assignment. This is the way that you simulate inputs coming from another circuit. Now, I realize that this is kind of strange and you probably won't have to write a test bench just for a RAM, uh, but you should be aware of that. Or if you do, you'll probably be writing the test bench maybe for your register file that has, an, that has the the uh, asynchronous read anyway. So in both of these cases, uh, I also did a write in addition to reads. I wrote the hex value dead beef to address six uh, by asserting the write enable for one cycle when the address is six. You can see that here. Uh, so there's your write enable, there's your address, write enable, um, and address. So I'm writing to address six in both cases. Now notice in the asynchronous RAM, the dead beef shows up uh, right after the write completes, which is on the first rising edge after the write enable goes high, which is right here. So that dead beef comes out of the read port. And, it, and that's happening because I, I left the, the, address, the address counter stopped at six. So basically I wrote to address six and then I immediately turned around and read from address six. And the, and the, read, the read took effect immediately as soon as the uh, the, 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 the write completed, which is on the rising clock edge. Now, if you look at at the bottom here on the synchronous RAM, uh, the dead beef was pushed over to the right by one cycle. So what happened there was that I wrote to address six. I wrote six as the address, dead beef is the data, uh, write data, data in, write data. And we have a rising edge of the clock uh, which would have performed the write, but at the same time I was performing the read of the old value of address six, which was six that came out. And then dead beef eventually showed up one cycle later, which gave it time to actually perform the read of the value that had been written in the previous cycle. Now, the, the point of all this is that in practice, implementing asynchronous read ports on a RAM is only feasible for a very small RAM, in particular a register file that has 32 entries in it. Anything larger than that, you know, anything like the size of a cache or a scratch pad memory, an on-chip RAM, uh, would require a synchronous RAM with a synchronous read. Asynchronous reading is, is only possible for very small RAMs. And the reason for that is because an asynchronously read RAM is going to be synthesized as, as literally an array of registers, not as a true RAM circuit. Uh, any real RAM is going to have a synchronous read behavior. If you want asynchronous reads, you have to implement the memory array with registers, which is very expensive. Uh, you end up having to invest you know, 20 or more transistors per bit 
as opposed to a real RAM that requires only six transistors per bit. So there's a big difference there in density. So any real RAM that you use, including the instruction memory that we're going to use for our CPU, needs to have a synchronous RAM. And this is why you need to understand the behavior of a synchronous uh, read port on a RAM. Smaller RAMs, though, uh, such as the register file, can also afford to have multiple ports. So we will endow both of these features, namely synchronous reads and multiple ports, on our register file because it's small. It's going to be a 32 entry, 32 wide RAM. So 32 addresses, 32 wide, 32 by 32 RAM. The register file will have two read ports and one write port since the RISC-V instructions need up to two input operands, a read up to two input operands uh, from registers RS1 and RS2, and then they write up to one register, which, is, which would be register RD, within the execution of one instruction. And we're hoping with RISC, in fact, sort of the point of the original objective of RISC architectures in general was to be able to execute one instruction per cycle. So we need to be able to read two registers and write one register in one cycle. That's, that's important. So we will have three ports on this RAM that have three different addresses, namely read address one, read address two, and write address. Then there will be, for each of the two read ports, we'll have two out data outputs, read data one and read data two. And then for the write port, there'll be one data input that we will call write data. Our register file will have asynchronous read ports because in, in our CPU design, which I'll talk about more soon, will merge together the decode and the execute stages. So we want to be able to read the registers and then perform an operation on those registers with the ALU within one cycle. So we'll use asynchronous reads. And in this code, I'm using a continuous assignment statement for each of the read ports. So that's the assign read data one and assign read data two statements inside the code. Uh, but you'll notice that we need to account for two special behaviors that are specific to the register file. The first is that any time we read register zero, we have to return the value, the constant zero, regardless of what actually, what actually might be stored in array element zero in the, in the RAM. Secondly, unlike the example shown in the previous slide, we want to support bypassed writes. Whenever we read and write the same entry, the same address at the same time. This means that we don't want the register file to behave like the RAM in the previous slide when we read and wrote to entry six at the same time, but we didn't see the value we wrote until after the write had committed. And this applied even for the, the, the version of the RAM that had an asynchronous read. We still had to wait a cycle before we saw the effect of writing to the register. Bypassing means that whenever we read a value that's being written in the same cycle, we will forward the value being written out of the read port. We need this feature because we're building a pipeline CPU where the write back stage happens after, in a different clock cycle, after the stage in which we read the registers, which means that we will potentially be writing the destination register for one instruction, which might be the same register as being read by one, of the, one or both of the source registers of the next instruction. So the next instruction in the code will be one stage in the pipeline behind us, and it will be potentially reading the register that we're currently writing back. Um, and so we need to make sure that if that happens, we receive the, the most updated value for that register. So implementing this in the code is actually quite simple. We just check to see if read address equals write address and 
uh, if write enable is asserted as well during the same time. And if that's the case, we just forward out the write data. And inside the register file, this is implemented with a, a mux on the output port. Um, the RAM is still generated the same way, except if we get this read and write conflict, then the mux will steer the write data out of the read port. And this has to happen for both read ports. You'll notice that this is done separately for both of the read ports. In order to achieve both behaviors for the read port, namely checking for zero and then checking for the right bypass, I incorporated these into a single nested ternary statement, one for each port. The right port is a, just a simple always block as I showed in the previous example. And in fact, this is, the, this is exactly the register file that you'll use in your CPU design. We're gonna give it to you. Now, I'd like to take a break and cover some concepts uh, before returning back to the applied material that you'll need for your CPU design. Parallelism is the concept of performing uh, multiple tasks on different parts of a workload, but performing them at the same time in order to improve performance. There's two types of parallelism that, that we'll cover in this class, spatial and temporal. Spatial parallelism is when you have multiple workers performing the same task, while temporal parallelism is when you have multiple workers performing different stages of a single task, which allows each worker to pass an incomplete result to the next worker until the work is complete. Both of these types of parallelism achieve the same performance, but temporal parallelism has an advantage in that the hardware, the total hardware requirement is only the hardware requirement needed to perform one task. Whereas in spatial parallelism, it requires the, the hard, double the amount of hardware required to perform one task because you have multiple workers, all of which are fully equipped to perform one task from start to end. Whereas in temporal parallelism, you take the amount of hardware needed to perform one task and you divide it into stages and then you need only to, to instantiate uh, the stages which combined is only enough for one task. So temporal parallelism is, is more efficient than spatial parallelism in that sense. But temporal parallelism is, is, is the more difficult concept to wrap your head around. You could think of it like an assembly line. Uh, there's also the, the, the concept of pipelining is builds on the idea of temporal parallelism. And the idea is that you allow the CPU to break down the, the workload of executing one instruction, but you break it into stages. You have this notion of a token, which is a group of inputs, like an instruction. Latency is the time it takes for one token to pass through the pipeline from start to end. And throughput is the rate at which tokens are processed for, for, per unit of time. And concurrency is the number of tasks that are active at one time. A parallelism is designed to increase throughput, often at the expense of latency. So there is, there's a trade-off here. We wanna process, we wanna push instructions through the pipeline as fast, as, as, as high of a rate as possible without necessarily caring about the time it takes to process from the time we see that from the time we start executing one instruction to the time we finish executing that instruction. That's that's latency. So here's an example. Ben Bitdiddle, this comes from the book, so they have a, a creative name, bakes cookies to celebrate the traffic light controller install installation. It takes five minutes to roll cookies and 15 minutes to bake the cookies. What's the latency and throughput without parallelism? Well, the latency would be five plus 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or a third of an hour from start to end. The throughput 
would be just the uh, the the inverse of the latency. So three chair, three trays of cookies per hour. So the throughput is can be defined as the concurrency divided by the latency. The concurrency is is thus the throughput times the latency. So the con con concurrency in this uh, case is three trays per hour multiplied by a third of an hour, meaning that one tray. It means we're only working on one tray at a time, which that makes sense. So what if we applied the concepts of spatial and temporal parallelism to this problem? So for spatial parallelism, it would be like if Ben asked Alyssa P. Hacker, his friend, to help using her own oven. And temporal parallelism would be like if we had two stages where we, of course, we have rolling and baking, which was previously described, and, but using two trays. And so while the first batch is baking, you, he, he, he rolls the second batch, um, or while, while someone is baking the first batch, then someone else uh, rolls the second batch. So in the case of spatial parallelism, the latency here is still a third of an hour, 20 minutes, but the throughput is two trays instead of one, as we had before, divided by a third of an hour, which is six trays per hour. So we've doubled our throughput. And so the concurrency in this case would be the product of those two, which is two trays. So when we apply temporal parallelism, the latency is still five plus 15, 20 minutes, one third of an hour. The throughput, however, is, is now you get one tray every 15 minutes. Why 15? Because 15 is uh, the time it takes to bake, which is the longer of the two tasks. And we are overlapping the time it, it takes to roll with the time it takes to bake. So since baking takes the longer of the two, the, th the throughput is determined by the amount of time it takes to bake, which is, uh, which we get, uh, which, which, which allows us to produce four trays for every hour, which is basically one divided by, um, one tray for every 15 minutes. The concurrency level is, uh, four thirds, uh, the product of the latency and the throughput, and it's one and one third trays, meaning that on average, we've got one and one third trays being worked on. And that's because Ben, Ben two rather, um, is, is Ben two, uh, finishes rolling after only five minutes and he's idle for 10 minutes while the previous batch finishes baking. So if you look at the total amount of time spent with these two tasks, it's, you, you only have uh, one and a third um, tasks active at any one time. That's our level of concurrency. Now we can use both techniques at the same time, in which case our throughput would be two trays every one fourth, of, one fourth an hour, which would be eight trays per hour if, if we had um, two people rolling and two people baking at the same time in, uh, in, in a pipeline. We will provide you with an ALU that performs all 13 operations required by the RISC-V processor. These include three bitwise logical operations and or an XOR, as well as add and subtract. There's also three variants of multiply. The, the first multiply provides the lower 32 bits of the product. The other two multiplies provide the high order 32 bits of the product, but the difference being whether or not you consider the, the operands to be signed or unsigned, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. There's also a logical left and right shift and an arithmetic right shift, and there is signed and unsigned less than. Now the table here shows essentially how to use the ALU. You provide a three-bit operation code, op code to the ALU, and um, the ALU will then perform the operation on A and B, um, which are both 32 inputs. It'll provide the result on a 32-bit output called R. And then there's also a zero output that will be one uh, whenever R is zero, and that will be used later for uh, resolving branches. 
Um, no, so notice, as I mentioned uh, before, there are signed and unsigned mol h operations. The mol h is refers to um, a times b, where I say a times b high sign, a times b high unsigned. This corresponds to the MIPS, sorry, the risk five instructions of mol h and mol h u. Why is that? Well, to ex explain, let's look at a, a simple four bit example. Uh, if we multiply the unsigned values 1 and 15, we get 15, which will produce um, a, uh, an 8 bit product, because if you're multiplying two 4 bit numbers, the product uh, needs to be uh, 8 bits. Um, and so we get uh, 15 in the lower 4 bits and 0 in the upper 15 bits. But if we take the same two numbers and multiply them, but we treat them as signed values, then we're multiplying 1 times negative 1 now which gives a product of negative one, the lower four bits of the negative one product are still the same, one, 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 but the upper four bits are now different. They're, they're the sign bit basically is one, 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 one in the upper, upper four bits. So what this means is, is that when you multiply, the lower 32 bits of the product is always the same, but the upper 32, bit, 32 bits will depend on whether the multiply was signed or unsigned. So that's why we have to have two versions of that. For the SLT, we could do a similar example with the same value. So if we compare 1 and 15, let's check to see if 1 is less than 15. Of course it is, so that should produce a true output from SLT. But if we treat those as sign numbers, now we're comparing 1 and negative 1, and 1 is not less than negative 1, so the result of that would be false. So the SLT also has to have different variants depending on whether we treat the inputs as signed or unsigned. Uh, make sure that you keep this table handy because even though we're providing the code for the ALU, you're still going to have to use the ALU and in order to use it, you're going to have to have access to this table because you're going to have to write your control unit in a way that sets this ALU opcode depending on what the ALU should be doing for that particular instruction during the execute stage. Now let's start talking about the next project, which is lab two or Project 2. Your objective in this project is to design a RISC-V CPU that can execute any program that is comprised of the 22 instructions shown on this list. These instructions span the R, I, and U formats and they describe arithmetic, logical shift, and comparison instructions. So these are all number crunching instructions essentially uh, with the exception of LUI and CSRRW. In the top level design we'll have two connections between the CPU and input and output peripherals. There's a 32-bit output that connects to eight seven segment decoders which then go off and connect to the 56 bits of the hex displays. The 32-bit output is driven by a register that the software can update using the CSRRW instruction. We have one input that comes from the 18 switches that can be read into a, a register, or actually I should say can be read and then written into a register in the CPU uh, by the software using the CSRRW instruction. In addition, uh, we have a clock, which is uh, comes from the clock 50, 50 megahertz clock, and we have a reset input that is connected to key zero, which is the rightmost key, or alternatively, you can connect it to key three. You might remember from CSEE 212 that instruction execution can be decomposed into five steps. Not all instructions require all five of these steps. In fact, there's only one instruction that does, which is the load instruction. All instructions perform the first two steps, uh, fetch, in which the instruction is read from memory, and decode, in which the instruction is converted into control signals, and the input source registers are read from the register file. The third stage, execute, is where the ALU does its number crunching. Some instructions, such as LUI and CSRRW don't need to do anything in the execute stage. You can tell which instructions don't use the ALU and thus the execute stage 
by looking at your control unit and identifying which instructions or which row in the control unit table does, doesn't have an entry for the ALU op or has a don't care for the ALU op rather, uh, which is the ALU input that I showed a few minutes ago. The fourth step or fourth stage is called memory and it's only used for load and store instructions. The fifth step, fifth stage is right back where the result is written to the register file at the destination register, the RD field. A single cycle CPU would perform all five of these steps or all five of these stages. And I, I you know, steps, stages sort of refers to whether when you, when you put each of these steps into a pipeline stage. Uh, so I, I use step and stage interchangeably. Uh, but in a, if, you, if we were designing a single cycle CPU, it would do all five of these steps uh, for one instruction in each cycle. However, we can't design our CPU in this way. And there's a few reasons for this. One of which is there's little chance that we can perform all the steps within one 50 megahertz clock cycle. Also, we need to make the instruction RAM have synchronous reads as well as the memory RAM if we add data memory. So we need to, thus we need to separate fetch with the steps after fetch and memory with the steps after memory. And, and this means that we need at least three cycles to, to execute an instruction. To simplify the design, uh, we'll use a three-stage pipeline design that performs fetch in the first stage, then, then decode, execute, and memory, all three of those things in the second stage, and then right back in the third stage. So even though we have five steps, fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back, in order to simplify our design, we won't be using a five-stage pipeline. We're going to use a three-stage pipeline where fetch and write back are in their own stages and decode, execute, and memory are in the second stage. In this way, each instruction will take three cycles to complete, as I'm showing here. So the latency of one instruction will be three cycles. And we can use temporal parallelism to execute three inst instructions at a time with each, in with each instruction in, in one of each of the three stages. This way, when instruction N is writing back, instruction N plus 1 is executing. And instruction N plus 2 is being fetched. Now, notice in this in this design, um, I, I don't I, I show in cycle zero we only have one instruction in the pipeline because the, the pipeline is being filled. In cycle one we have two instructions, and in cycle three we have three instructions. In cycle three we have two instructions because at that point the pipeline is being emptied because I, I'm pretending as though uh, the program only has three instructions. But normally under steady state operation, once the pipeline is filled it will always have three instructions being executed in parallel, uh, each of which at their different stages. You'll have one instruction in fetch, one instruction in decode, and one instruction in write back. Now it turns out that the RISC-V instruction set architecture is so simple, and I say this even in comparison to the MIPS instruction set architecture. So this is even simpler than MIPS. It's so simple, they designed it to be so simple or they designed it to lend itself to an implementation that is so simple, rather, that I can fit the whole structure of the, of the RISC-V CPU, at least for the 22 instructions that we're targeting, I can fit the whole structure, the schematic, on three PowerPoint slides, which I think is pretty, um, I think is pretty impressive. Your job is to translate each of these structures that I'm showing in the slides uh, to structural system Verilog. The only significant piece of behavioral code that you'll need to design is the control unit.
which as I mentioned is essentially just a table, truth table. But in system Verilog, truth tables are built with if then else statements or, uh, or case statements. Although in this case, I would recommend using an if then else. So we'll start with fetch, sorry, we'll start with fetch and decode. To be clear, fetch is performed over the course of one cycle and decode is part of the second stage. So this design I'm showing you spans two pipeline stages. And the reason for that is because you can see this R box is a pipeline register. And, and it's the only pipeline register because the instruction memory has a synchronous read. So for all practical purposes, you have pipeline registers that are sort of built into the instruction memory as part of its synchronous read. So, so the fetch stage is comprised of the instruction memory shown here. It's a RAM. Uh, it's a RAM with one, one read port. And the program counter, which is just a counter. And I'll actually give you the code for these two things, the instruction memory, the, the instruction memory RAM and the program counter on the next slide. Since the instruction memory will take one cycle to read each instruction, as I mentioned, because it's a synchronous read, uh, its output, which I call instruction underscore EX, and I, and I use that underscore EX suffix to, to mean that it, it belongs or it's associated with the instruction that's currently in the execute stage. And, and also remember when I say execute stage, I'm really referring to the decode, execute, and memory steps. In other words, at any point in time during execution, the instruction EX signal will be set, or the value on there, will correspond to the instruction that is stored at an address in the instruction memory that the program counter was pointing to in the previous cycle, right? Because the program counter is in fetch, and instruction EX is in execute. Instruction EX represents the, the address that was read in the previous cycle. So when you look at PC fetch, current value of the program counter, that's actually pointing to the next instruction as compared to instruction EX, the next instruction in the program. Now the instruction EX signal is logically split into several pieces that correspond to the instruction encoding. Now this is a bit tricky because we're dealing with instructions that span three different encodings. We have a we have an R type, I type, and U type. So uh, you you when you look at these encodings, you have to consider all three types. The control unit needs to receive all of the bits that are associated with the control information in the instruction. So that means the seven bit opcode that that is in uh, bits six down to zero, which is the, the rightmost bits. But then there's a seven bit function seven code that is in bits 31 down to 25. So in the R-type instruction, there's a seven bit opcode on both sides of the <laughs> instruction encoding. And then there's also a three bit function code called func3, which spans bits uh, 14 down to 12. And then there's a 12 bit CSR field that is bits 31 down to 20. Uh, and notice that the CSR field is overlapping the function seven bits. Um, and together, if we consider all of these fields, uh, they add up to 22 out of the 32 instruction bits. So obviously, it's, it's actually easier to feed all the instruction bits to the control unit and only refer to the fields uh, needed inside the control unit, in which case, when you go to synthesize this, the bits that aren't read, obviously, wouldn't, would be optimized out. They, you know, they wouldn't be routed. Okay, note that the instruction memory is simple enough that you can instance its code in line if you, if you want, or alternatively, you can put the instruction memory in, into its own module. Um, but the, the control unit probably should be designed with its own module, put in its own separate module, because it'll be, um, it will be much longer in terms of the code. But you could inline the control unit too if you prefer. The reg file, the reg file uh, will receive the RS1 and RS2 fields into its read address one and read address two inputs. 
And remember, we gave you the red reg file code. The write address input on the reg file will receive the RD field from the instruction. But since the the write back stage is in the third is the third stage, you need to be careful to delay the RD field by one cycle by inserting a register. So basically, what this really boils down to, a lot of this this these fields is just bit slicing out specific bits and plugging them into the appropriate spots. Now note that the, the instruction memory is, is, a, is a RAM, it's only a few lines of code, so it's simple enough that if you want you can, you can inline its code. You know, you can, you can just put its code in as opposed to uh, developing a module uh, for the instruction memory, but that's, that's up to you, that's a personal preference. The control unit on the other hand is going to be much longer in terms of code size and I would recommend that you design that one uh, in its own module, but if you prefer you can inline the control unit code as well and, and I'll show you, uh, I'll talk more about the control unit soon. You can initialize the instruction memory by dumping a hex file for your RISC-V code from RARS, the, he the hex file will be a text file with each instruction on its own line in hex, des in hex format. It'll look essentially just like test vector. So you can, um, you can use an initial block with your instruction memory with the $readmemh system verilog task to initialize your program into your instruction memory. The code for this, as well as the, the program counter and the instruction memory, is shown on this slide. You can use this directly. Um, the, we have an always FF block that includes the logic for resetting the, the instruction EX, as well as the program counter, as well, and as well as uh, incrementing the program counter and implementing the single read port, synchronous read port on the instruction memory. The control unit will output the reg write signal, which is a flag that indicates if the instruction in the EX stage will write a register in the register file. Uh, this signal must be delayed to send it into the uh, write back stage. So there's two versions of this signal. There's reg write EX, which is the value in the EX stage, and there's reg write WB, which is the value in the write back stage. This is uh, also similar for uh, the reg select signal, which determines which value will be written back among three options. Option one would be the input from the switches. Option two would be the, the U-type shifted immediate field from the LUI instruction. And option three is the ALU output. And of course, they can be in any order you'd like. That's, I just gave you the order that I'm showing them here. The switch input, the U-type immediate, and the ALU output must likewise be delayed to push them from the execute stage uh, to, into the write back stage. Now you might wonder why we don't delay the output of the MUX here instead of delaying the inputs, and this is because if we add a data memory uh, for load instructions, it will have its own built-in delay because it'll also be a synchronous read, and so this would make it incompatible with that approach. Um, we can, oh, we also connect the read data one output from the register file directly into the ALU, into the A input. And the B input on the ALU will be connected to a MUX that will allow you to select between the read data two option uh, from the register file um, or the sign extended immediate from an I type instruction. Finally, we need to connect the read data one output of the register file to the hex register, which is uh, enabled using another control signal from the control unit that, that I called hex write enable. And this of course would be for writing to the hex displays. The control unit is a truth table. And we provide an example of this. This is only for a few instructions. This is not complete, but this gives you kind of an idea of how to structure. The inputs come from the instruction bits and the outputs are the ALU operation. Um, which is from the ALU operation table, uh, as well as the ALU source, um, which essentially defines whether the instruction is an R-type or an I-type instruction. The register select, which is um, normally selecting the, the output of the ALU, but you have to also support the, um, the CSRR uh, and the, the instruction and the load up or media instruction. 
Uh, the register file write enable, which is the one whenever you have an instruction that writes to the register file, and the hex register write enable. This slide shows a test program that will exercise all 22 instructions, although this is a very limited test case, but it should give you a good starting point for writing test cases for your CPU. The second pro program that we'd like you to write for your CPU is a binary to base 10 converter program, which will take the 18-bit value from the switches, which is a value, an integer that, 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 that is in the range of 0 to 2 to the 18th power minus 1, which is 262,143. So it's a value you get from the switches between 0 and 60, 262,143. And we want to convert that to 8 decimal values that will then be displayed on the 7-segment hex displays. And this is a very straightforward algorithm. You basically take the input value, you calculate its modulo 10, uh, then you put the, the, that result on the rightmost hex digit, and then you divide the value by 10, and you repeat, filling in each digit from right to left. One issue, though, that we need to solve is that we don't have um, a branch instruction, so you can't write this as a loop, the repeating part. You have to copy and paste each of the eight steps as linear code. Another issue, and this is a, a even bigger issue, is that we don't have a divide instruction or a modulo instruction. Uh, but since the second operand to both the divide and the modulo operations is a constant, we can use the multiply instruction instead. So in order to do this, we need to use, we need to use fixed point arithmetic. You can divide a number by 10 by multiplying it by 0.1. You can represent 0.1 uh, as one -tenth, of, uh, one tenth of the range of a 32-bit integer which is going to be 2 to the 32nd power minus 1 divided by 10, or 429,496,730. You can, if you multiply this against a value, you'll end up with the, the quotient in the upper 32 bits of the result of the multiply, and the fractional part in the lower 32 bits. And then to recover the modulo, you need only to multiply the fractional part by 10. And then once you do this, then you would read the upper 32 bits of the product, which would be the modulo. So here's an example. Uh, assume that the user enters 234. You multiply that by 0.1, you get 20... Uh, you get 23 in the upper 32 bits and 0.4 in the lower 32 bits of the product. And the actual value for 0.4 would be one, one, uh, 4 tenths, rather, of the, uh, of the value of the range of um, 2 to the 32 minus 1. So it would be 2 to the 32 minus 1 times 0.4 would, would be uh, your 0.4 value. If you keep the uh, 23 and you multiply the 0.4 by 10 you get 4 that becomes the least significant digit in the output then 23 times 0.1 becomes 2.3 which will give you a 3 and then uh, the 2 multiplied by 0.1 will give you 0.2 which gives you the 2 so your goal in this project is to um, design oh, this is another representation of the algorithm um, your goal is to design the CPU uh, building up from the reg, reg, reg file, ALU, fetch stage, and a control unit template that we provide to you, uh, and also to write this base 10 conversion program in RISC V assembly, and then be able to run this program on top of your CPU on the virtual DE2 board. So as always, this is described also in the lab sheet uh, very extensively, uh, but, but this is still a complex project, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you.